Hey, Feel Good Fathers, thanks so much for tuning in. We're continuing on our series of the one-year anniversary, the first 54 episodes of Feel Good Fatherhood. I'm here with my brother and uh, I think mentor, friend, confidant, collaborator, Mike Forrester. Uh, he's been so gracious to help me in the sort of year-end milestone episodes. We're going to be talking today about the first 26, 25, 26 episodes, the major lessons. So for those of you just turning in, just learning about Feel Good Fatherhood and what it's about, this could give you a high level overview of what to tune into and which episodes you want to listen to. So my man, Mike, uh, let's start. And I think you left off one crucial part, instigator of trouble. <laughs> Dude, we're both into it. It's like, who's coming up with the idea? What kind of trouble are we getting into? So, oh, no, man. Let's bring it. I, let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm I'm totally honored and appreciate the fact of being able to be here with you. So as we're reflecting back on the first half of this one year of episodes, you know, life gets crazy. We're not all able to tune into each and every episode. But the big thing about feel good fatherhood is how do we apply these lessons, what we're learning. And so from this kind of, you know, year in summary, if there's something that you're like, Hey, I'm lacking in this area. Mm. This is an opportunity for you to catch the episode and go back. If there's something you're like, I really want to double down, same thing. Listen to which episode it is, go back and catch all the details from this. But this is almost like your table of contents, right? A high level summary to really give you that opportunity to say this is in scope, the areas that we can jump into, and then you get to decide how do you want to show up in life? How do you want things to be seen for you as a father from your, you know, your children and who you're impacting and setting that uh, pattern for growth, right? So Jay, let's go ahead, jump in. Um, there was this troublemaker in episode one, uh, you and I had a conversation. What was it that most impacted you from episode one? Episode one, overcoming self-criticism with Mike Forrester is the episode. And there were two core, like really, really important lessons, I think from this episode. And the first was having that acknowledgement of who does your family need protection from? And protection comes in a couple of different areas that comes from emotional, intellectual, sometimes physical and spiritual. So those are different areas. And, and really I'm saying protection, but boundaries is the same thing. And what I learned from interviewing this, this crazy guy was understanding and evaluating the people that are in your life and who actually is privileged to contribute to your family as a role as a father. This is one of your key points to make is who gets into the house. And who, who has the right to speak into you and who has the right to speak into your family? Uh, this was a great lesson. I think we had a wonderful discussion about this, this, this particular aspect. Lots of good details in there. Um, and the other one, uh, this is something that I, I really love and enjoy. And this came from a conversation between me and my wife was setting up and creating rewards for mm -hmm. chores. This is normal. Like this is absolutely normal. You do some work, you get a reward at the end of it. But there are other more creative ways than just an allowance or just a thing. And so we did, uh, we, I talk about this in some later episodes as well, but for my oldest, the, the classic example was this. She didn't get to watch the Harry Potter movies until she read the Harry Potter books. So we set up this foundation of enjoying and reading these books and that created this nice reward where as a family, we can sit down and watch the movies together. So it kind of anchored this experience. And I'm really happy and proud to say is that now she reads tons. She reads tons of books. She just, she has this love of reading because she read all eight of those books. So I think that um, as a father, putting together the correct, the correct, yeah, the correct and the healthy habits and the correct and the healthy routines and hobbies. Um, it has a lot of rewards to it and being really intentional. That's, that's what we discussed in episode one boundaries and rewards. Mm, that's powerful to instill, especially at a younger age, like you are. Well, let's jump forward to episode two. And that was with Chris Rivera on uh, 
parent with forgiveness and discipline. What was your big takeaway from uh, that episode? Chris told me this wonderful story about uh, the French Japanese man and how really he evaluated character based on what do you do when nobody's watching. And I, I thought, man, when he, when he laid this down, I just kept thinking, who am I when nobody's around? Who am I when, uh, you know, when I'm working? Who, like, what am I thinking about? What am I doing? How much work am I doing? I've been listening to this motivational speaker, Marcus Brown, and it's just like the work that you do in the dark when you come out into the light. And that's just, and really it's the work you're doing in private contributes to who you are in public. And so this really on a very experiential level is like, how do you speak to yourself? Like nobody's with you with your thoughts. So how do you speak to yourself? Are you kind to yourself? Are you uplifting to yourself? Are you, are you positive? That's going to have an impact in the way that you act. Are you disciplined, well-spoken and kind in your house and then disciplined, well-spoken and kind outside of your house? There's a consistency of action that I learned from Chris right from that parable of the French and Japanese man. Another core example, and this is, I, I get so heartbroken when I see this today is so many of us are blaming other people for what's happening in the in our life and the choices that we're making in our life. And he was just very direct. He just said, stop blaming your parents for what you're doing in your house. I'm like, yeah, like, of course. No, like, it takes a little bit of work. It takes a little bit of self-reflection. It takes a little bit of that deep work of that healing to get to that stage. But nothing that you're doing in your life, nothing that you're doing in your home is your parents' fault. The final one, and I thought this was really great, was there's really no right way. There's no right way to parent. Um, as a student, as a studier of parenting techniques, let me tell you, there's tons. There's tons of different different ideas about the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it. It really is this, and this is kind of where I've come down, like what's the line, what do I believe? It's a mix of tradition, your tradition, your spouse's tradition, and then modern techniques. That's it. That's that's what parenting is. So there's no right way, wrong way, and like that. There's just a mix of what is traditional in general, and that should probably only be like 10%. Most of it should come from what are your traditions? What are your spouse's traditions? What traditions do you want to create? And then, I mean, if you're really into it and you really care about this, this role, learning a little bit, learning about how kids develop, learning how the brain develops, learning how to communicate effectively. There's just these extra modern approaches and extra modern skills. And that's really what we got from Chris. Hmm, I love that. Uh, episode three was with Martin Hewlett about anger. Oh man. Well, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Martin's, Martin's powerful. Well, how did that impact you? There's two core things that men have to deal with to go from boyhood to manhood. And there's two emotions. And those two emotions are anger and lust. And I think that what I really learned from Martin was he was very open and honest about how he was angry and what that rage and what that anger did to his life and how he acted on it. And oh, I think we all, he shared this one line I thought was really interesting and worth pondering on. And it was, when you're angry, most people, even, even, you know, we're mostly we're talking about men and fathers, but even women are, they become destructive of the things that are theirs. And I put theirs in quotes for those of you that are, that are listening. And it's just this idea that anger destroys relationships. It just, it can just, if, if you're a physically anger person, it can destroy the things that you have. Um, and if you have it and it's out of control, it's, it definitely is worth figuring out why, figuring out what it is. I've been watching Suits lately. So, um, and I really, I really kind of like when I was reflecting on um, Martin's discussion, I was reflecting on the character Lewis Litt. And he's a very no boundary, very open, heart on his sleeve, emotional being. And there are definitely moments where he brings that anger and that rage and you can see the self-destruction. 
And I think what I love about the way that the men are portrayed in suits is that you get to see the total range of experience. People that are that never lose their cool, people that have anger, you know, people that have joy, that kind of stuff. I, I really like it. I, I really like that aspect of that conversation. And then the final one, and this is, it's, it's really funny because I, I did some studies on this to see, or rather I looked at and read some studies to see whether this was true. Most men don't form an emotional bond with their kid until they hold it for the first time. So through the entire pregnancy, there's just this crazy thing happening to your wife. And it, there's a handful of moments, a handful of activities you can do to anchor that your new child in your mind. Um, I believe the ultrasound is one. It's one thing that, that can make the child real. Uh, feeling kicks and moves and activities but as your child gets older. Um, in the belly as your child gets older. I don't even know. Is your fetus gets more developed? I don't even know how to say that. It doesn't, like, when they kick. Uh, reading to you, watching the reactions, that kind of stuff. And, and Martin shared this moment where he was a stay-at-home dad when his first child was born. I was a stay-at-home dad when my first child was born. And I can remember being like, oh man, I got to go make sure that there's food on the table and provider and all this other kind of stuff going through my head as I'm holding this baby that I had no idea what to do with. <laughs> so that was just, it was a lot of fun kind of getting to live that moment together. Yeah, I think my emotional attachment was <laughs> trying to be next to my wife and then being kicked and going like, uh, stop. <laughs> I'm just trying to hang out here. Oh, man. So episode four, that was Nicole McDonald, teenage years. How did that, uh, what was your big takeaway from there? It's really nice to meet somebody else that's on a mission to really change society and perception on a really big and meaningful scale. Nicole, crazy story about meeting Nicole. I met her at a Tony Robbins UPW. Uh, she was actually the first, she was actually the first guest I overtly didn't know that I invited onto the show because I found out mm. who she was and what she was doing. And she was in my backyard. So we, she was in upstate New York where I was living at the time. Her mission is to really rewrite the language scenarios and idioms around the teenage years. And it was so enlightening to, to see her walk through the different things that we say about, about teenagers and how that applies to how we react with them. Here's the, here was the big one that really struck me was this idea that teenagers are going to be teenagers. They need to get out the house. They need to find their own wings. They need to figure out who they are. And it all has to be outside the house. And I, her perspective and what I've come to believe is even my perspective is like, they don't have to do any of that outside the house. Why would you want in the years where your children are developed in the, the most crucial elements of their personality, their identity, and their values to go out and hang out with people that don't have their best interest at heart. And I think as a parent, as a father, as a mother, why wouldn't you want to help guide them through these? I don't know about you. When I was a teenager, my teenage years were crazy. Uh, you know, and, and my parents did a pretty good job of, I think, of being with me and walking alongside me as I was kind of figuring out who I was and what my body was doing. And um, I don't know. I just, I, I, I think it's weird that we have these these concepts that they got to get out and they got to go be a young adult and all this kind of stuff. When it's like, I think they really need, I think teenagers really need more mentorship and I think they need more guidance than we provide for them. Hmm. And uh, when you reflect on episode five, Josh Cantrell needs impact um, how you show up. What was like your action kind of, looking and reflecting on, on that, how did it uh, move you forward? There are certain things we want from our young kids and the way that we treat our young kids is going to impact how they see us and what they do. And this is normal. This is, this is pretty common knowledge, but Josh really taught me about 
he taught me two core things. And the first, the first core thing was making sure your kids know that they can ask you for help and being receptive and listening when they are asking for help. This manifests in so many different ways. And, um, I really think this leans into the, how are you showing up? Are you present? Are you listening? And one of the core things that I've really adopted since that episode was I, I practiced some pretty radical accountability to my oldest daughter, where even when I make mistakes, there's been, yeah, I just go and I just apologize. I explain what was happening for me. I explained, Hey, I should have done better. This is what, you know, this is what was going on. Even yesterday she came to me and she, uh, we were preparing family as, uh, we were preparing dinner as a family and I was kind of wrapping up my work day. And so I was trying to make sure that all the admin things were done. And she said, Hey, come on out to the kitchen because I want you to do this one thing with me. And I, I said, okay, I'll be there in like five or 10 minutes. Cause I'm wrapping this thing up. Cause I'm just like, Hey, I want my daughter to know what I'm doing. I want her to know that work has a priority and that there's boundaries around those time things. Well, when I came out, what she wanted done, and it doesn't matter if she was impatient or not, but she wanted that thing completed and she went to mom to get it done. And so I kind of came out, I saw that the thing that she wanted my help with was complete. And so I just went to her and I said, Hey, when you asked what I really should have done was said, all right, I have some admin things, but I'm going to come help you with the thing you wanted. Then I'm going to go back to work and wrap up my task. And so in that one moment, like just in that quick moment, I didn't listen to her. I didn't help her when she was asking me for help or even for my attention. And so I said, Hey, this is what happened. This is what I was doing. Cause I want her to know that I was at work. And I said, Hey, I'm going to change this behavior next time. So when you ask if I can get up, I'm going to help you with that thing, but I'm probably gonna have to go back to work so that she understands that situation and she can kind of build a mental model of her. So that was that I, and I really think this is very often overlooked for, for parents of being responsive and being open when your kids are asking for something from you. I guess there were three things. The second thing really from Josh was really cultivating that core relationship with your wife. And this is a feel good father thing. Like we face our wife. That's it. Like support your wife, face your wife, face your spouse. However, you know, whatever side you're on, just lean in. And they are the primary relationship that you have period. Um, so that was that making sure that your kids know that and making sure that everybody else around you knows that, that you're now a family man and you're married. And finally, and this is, I, I really like this one. This was a good lesson. This is the good one was that, um, most of the time, I think as parents, we think we have to protect our kids from what's going on, I think. And so when a crisis or, or something changes, some sort of dynamic changes, I think we tend to want to protect our kids. And I think it really does a disservice to them about how resilient they can be, how much learning and understanding they can. Now, I'm not saying... I'm not saying like drop adult level information to them, but for Josh, they, you know, they found out that one of the sons had autism and they brought that into the house and they explained it at an age appropriate way, how to, how that navigated and how that showed up and manifested as his personality. So there was a crisis, there was a change, there was something that was changing in the dynamic of the family and the family was enrolled in it. And I think that was just, really powerful of, Hey, get your kids involved. It's their house too. They got to navigate stuff. Why hide it? Let's go. Yeah. Presenting it where it's age appropriate, keeping them involved just makes everything more cohesive. So as we uh, move over to episode six with Danny Bader principles, how are you showing up? Hmm. What was uh, your big takeaway on that one? Danny Bader is an interesting fellow. So his, his core story is that he had this crazy accident and died for like um, two minutes or something like that. He was like, he was actually dead for like two and a half minutes, had this life changing experience. And it really fundamentally changed the way that he kind of moved through life. And um, that was really neat. He's got, uh, we actually met because I introduced myself as Jay, which is my name. And he was like, oh, 
you're a character in a book I wrote. So he's, he writes, he's a serial writer. So he writes these parables. He was like, Oh, you're this character. And he like handed me the book. <laughs> it's like, awesome. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> but um, what he really took as, and we spent the first part of the conversation was really just talking about love as a guiding principle. And I think it's, it's, um, I have the, these experiences with these nebulous words, like love is kind of a, nebulous word because it's describing an emotion and then it's like fun like fun is a nebulous word like you know when you're having fun but you don't know when you're not having fun but you couldn't really describe fun meaningfully um this is a uh a discussion that i learned about the fun perspective from making video games there's tons of different kinds of fun right there's construction uh expression achievement uh um uh um winning like you're a competition kind of fun so there's different kinds of like emotions that you feel there but love uh his thing was like what can you do to make love your guiding principle your guiding emotion and everything and so i here it's less of a i have less reaction to it i think i more have a question for the feel good fathers which is just how does love show up for you and how do you experience love that's one thing uh, Danny also has, he went through being a father and now he's an empty nester. And so his kids live out of the house. That was super interesting talking to him about the difference between being the authority figure, guider, teacher, parent into more friend, mentor, counselor role. Hmm. And that was really interesting kind of watching that stage and knowing that um, I have 10 years between my oldest and my youngest daughter. And so I'm going to have that. I'm going to be living both when my oldest daughter leaves high school, where I'm going to have one where I'm mentoring, friend, guiding, kind of seeing how she, how she makes decisions in her adult life. And another one who's still young, the kid. And so it's going to be interesting when that happens in, a, in about, you know, 10 years or so. So, um, and then finally, and this is kind of, it's been this theme with, with a lot of fathers on the show, which is what are your, what are your values? What are your, um, your principles, your mottos as a father? And I think this kind of, we talked about traditions as with, with the Chris Rivera episode, I think this is one of those areas where a more traditional spousal unit might want the father to sort of lead the values of the house. And I think a more modern understanding would be that both spouses come together to create the values of the home. That's what we did. So in my home, we came up with the values together. And, but I definitely think that as a father, you should have an understanding of your family in the same way that mom should have an understanding of her family. So I think that's enough on, on that episode. Lots of good discussion there about the stages of parenthood and values and, and love. Really, really solid to listen to. Yeah. Danny is like the embodiment of love. So it's, it's definitely a healthy perspective on who we can be and how we can show up that may not be something we're familiar with. Uh, as you reflect back on episode seven with Jack Gibson, generational wealth, what comes to mind from that? This was the genesis of one of the newest ideas for feel good fatherhood, which is this core idea that as a father, one of your big responsibilities is to pass on the skills and knowledge to the next generation. This is sort of, um, built into anthropological studies. Uh, Dr. Anna Manchin's work talks a bit about this, that in the past, while mom was taking care of the young ones or being pregnant, that there wasn't a lot of, you know, if we're thinking about the context outside of modern medicine, she wasn't as mobile. She had to really kind of focus on keeping baby alive or babies alive. And so dad's responsibility was, well, he was the mobile one. So he had to go hunter, gather, provide, and he had to then teach and enroll. And Jack spent 
a lot of time in our discussion talking about teaching his sons about what he's good at, which is business, finances, and creating wealth. And I thought, what a great lesson. I mean, number one, there's a handful of feel good fathers that I interview that specifically talk about making money and finances and growing, growing your income and then creating wealth. Uh, and I, and I think you should listen to them feel good father. So <laughs> there's that piece. Uh, but this, but the core principle of passing the lessons on to your sons, I, I thought that was really eye opening. Um, and I think even then for your kids, I, I really started to practice well, what could I teach my daughter and my, you know, and at that time, uh, did I have one? Was she? I'm not sure. But uh, what could I teach my daughter about my life and the skills I had? And then the other one, and I think in today's society, this is, this is a really challenging concept to, to grasp. On social media and in networking and stuff like that, you see the end result. So in any given moment, when you're looking at anybody, you're not looking at the mountains as they, that they've climbed. You're not looking at the businesses that they founded. You're not looking at their failures. You're looking at sort of the finished product in the moment. Nobody's a finished product, but in that particular moment, it's the finished product. It took Jack 18 years to get his first business up and running and, and to be proud of it and to have it be profitable and, and stuff like that. 18 years. That's the age of a kid graduating from high school. So I think this goes back to that principle where people really, really overestimate what they can do in a year. And it, in my work today as a personal brand strategist, helping with business, marketing, branding, um, helping mostly solopreneurs and small business owners grow their, grow their business, a lot of people just really underestimate like they were rather they overestimate what they can do in a year and they underestimate the amount of effort, time and energy it takes to just grow something into a profitable personal brand or a profitable business. And this, I think this lesson here of um, just keep going. I mean, this is like even the Elon Musk story of today. Like dudes had like four failures, like major failures, two or three major successes, like he just doesn't give up. So I, I really think that, um, we really, we really are addicted to this instant gratification and short-term reward, reward world. And it, I think it's up to us to really have our eye on the ball in the long term, and to keep going, to persevere, to not give up, to execute on the vision. That takes effort and intention. Yeah, I love that for the resiliency and persistence that it takes, not just in the business, but also our marriage, raising kids. So having that mindset from the get-go, man, that, that sets us up for a lot better um, long-term success. Mm -hmm. Well, let's jump up to episode eight. And I believe this was like your most popular episode for the year. And that was with Dr. Uh, Jenny Prohashka in Understanding Trauma. Dr. Jenny is, uh, that was so fun. It was such a fun episode. It was the most popular episode. So if you're going to listen to one, please go listen to that one. <laughs> so episode eight, uh, this was, it was so interesting because the, as I was talking with her, I was recognizing patterns, not only in my father, but also in my mother, in myself, in my spouse, the whole thing. Like, I was just like, wow, like just kind of watching these different, these different behaviors. Um, that was the first thing was like, how does, how does trauma drama show up? I really liked that, um, that part. So there, that, that learning, that deep understanding of, I think most of us, and I would definitely agree with this is that a lot of us, well, yeah, probably, probably a lot of us have under or um, undiscovered issues that we haven't dealt with. And here's, here's the thing. I'm, I'm not a, a big fan of overt therapy. I think in short bursts, I think it's great kind of work through a specific issue. Um, I found that without a really, really good therapist, 
that you're doing a lot of reliving the past and that's not helping you develop into the future. Um, and that in particular is a very male model for development. Um, uh, I don't really want to get into that too much, but there's a lot of, there's actually just a lot of study by psychologists on this factor that um, the traditional counseling slash therapy model is more for women. It's a women focused um, occupation uh, because that it, and it specifically has to do with the model of one person sitting across from another person and discussing their issues. All of that being said, if you're in a high stress thing or you got trauma, you got to go deal with it in some way, shape or form. And, um, I do think, especially for her and her expertise that in the first responder world, so first responder, military security forces, that kind of stuff, I, you need to go talk to somebody to, to handle what you're doing to transition back to civilian life. So there's that piece. The other piece I really love, and this is, I think, I think this one just instinctually, the moment she said it, I was like, that's how I made it. So I had one of my first jobs, I was in a, a tech based call center. And if you've ever worked in a call center, uh, you kind of get yelled at all day long. <laughs> and, and so, uh, I was, I was there and I, I remember I had set up my life such that every day of the week, including Saturday and Sunday, like every single day, there was an extracurricular extracurricular activity that I did. So there was some sort of hobby or some sort of thing I was doing. And then I would round it out with on Sunday, I would go work out and then um, I would sit in the sauna in the steam room to kind of get everything ready. Then I would go home, wrap by night and I would start the week again. And when Dr. Jenny was talking about, there's these spokes. And if you have fewer spokes, you have less resiliency. And the image she used was the spokes and the wheel. So fewer spokes makes the wheel less solid. It makes the structure of it less able to take the turning and definitely makes it less able to um, handle bumps in the road. But she said, if you have more spokes, which meant if you had more relationships, more hobbies, more people to lean on, more things to look forward to, larger purpose, bigger mission, bigger meaning, all this kind of stuff, like all the stuff that we're dealing with in today's society in the modern context meaninglessness, purposelessness, um, unsatisfactory work, unfulfillment, etc. If you fill that with other things, and that what I mean by there is healthy hobbies, healthy face-to-face relationships, healthy goals, healthy vision for your life, it makes taking these, what could just be a bad day, and it makes it tolerable. Because what happens is that without that structure, the bad day can become a traumatic event because you've become isolated and you can't handle it. But if you've got the strength of that wheel, if you have the strength of those spokes, you can really survive. You can really survive and thrive. Um, and then the other thing was, and this was a brief comment, was that a lot of times we think that people have trauma when they actually just have drama. And it's really just this over-focus on... Um, it's the over-focus on a self-actualized focused world. Focus on individual gratification and selfishness. That's, that's really what it is. And that over-self-actualization is really just, just selfishness. The feel-good fathered way is to get outside of yourself and serve the people that are in your life and serve the people around you and build relationships with them. So if we over-focus on ourselves and we diminish the focus on others, we create more trauma in our life. And that's just, I think that's just real. Okay, that's enough. Talked about Dr. Jenny tons. It was a great episode. Go listen to it. Yeah, the bicycle tire is a great analogy because if you think about an actual bicycle tire, when it gets out of true, you know, it's bent, it takes so much more effort, man. It's rubbing against the brakes. You don't get the traction. So reflective of our lives. Um. Next one is episode nine with Brett Gordon on growth mindset. This was such a fun, I thought this was such a fun, playful conversation because not only is Brett a, a really good dude, uh, but he's so focused on responsibility and growth, like as this, this sort of principle for his life and how he runs the family, that when we talked about 
this moment, I couldn't help but ref- like that he shared on the episode. I couldn't help but reflect on when have I done something as 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 poorly thought out as that. And so he talked about taking his daughter, who was like six, out into a, like a, a very heavy tide area on the ocean in Hawaii. And it was like, you know, when on reflection from an outside of river, you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, that's just like, what are you doing? That seems like not a smart thing to do. But on the other side, it was the, you know, he was in the moment having a great time with his family. And the best part of that story was just the, oh, he turned to his daughter and he said, hey, we're in trouble. We got to go. We got to figure it out. It's going to take a bit. Hold on to me and we're going to go. And I thought, I love that. I think of, um, I think a lot like of one of my favorite movie characters and one of my favorite movies is Aliens. It's James Cameron's Aliens, the the second one with um, Sigourney Weaver. And when she rescues Newt at the end, because I'm, I'm not saying spoilers because it's like a 1980s movie. So if you haven't seen it, <laughs> I don't even know what to say to you. Uh, it's one of the best action movies of all time. Um, right. She's like, hold on to me. And she's carrying like, it's this great model for the mother protector going in, getting the, getting the daughter, getting the offspring, doesn't matter if it's a son or a daughter, going and saving them and, you know, carrying them on the back, fighting against impossible odds. You know, like I think the only other, the other character I see from the eighties that's a lot like that is like Linda Hamilton, uh, her Sarah Connor in the Terminator series, uh, which if you haven't drawn the line yet, they're both James Cameron movies. <laughs> so uh, both great examples of, of strong motherhood. Um, that it, it did remind me of those characters that he was like, hey, we're in trouble. Let's get out. Hold on to me. Let's go. Um, the other part that I loved about Brett's story, being a techie myself, being a, a tech dad, having me in video games, being very focused on sort of the more modern knowledge work computer world was just get outside, just get outside and play in nature and get dirty and roll around and, and just get outside of the, these little monitors there, uh, that there's a lot of balance and a lot of really good things that can come from that piece. Uh, so I, I really enjoyed Brett's conversation as well. As you reflect back on, uh, episode 10 with Eric Cabral, power of self-awareness, what stood out to you in that one? Here was this, person who successful investor successful masterminder public speaker podcast host owns a podcast company at the center of everything that is this person in this being is effective communication and the whole discussion was what are the different ways that you can communicate effectively and have those great moments of conversation with your spouse, with your kids, at home, at work. And when I think about skill development, when I think about why do why do marriages fail? Why do people have a rough time at work? Why do people um, why do people have the trouble that they have in life? And it's why do fathers and men, what, what's the main thing between fathers and men and the life that they want to have? It's that relationship skill of communicating. And this conversation talked about that, talked about communication. What do we want? What do we need? When are we feeling vulnerable? When is it appropriate to be powerful? Because for some reason, we don't like men being powerful. It's weird. Uh, when is it appropriate to be powerful? When is it, when is what is respectful communication? What is when do you have to be an authority? When do you submit? Um, everything, just everything about communication and self awareness. Um, and not only that, Eric is a fun guy. So 
that was a good conversation. Yeah, it's a powerful episode. And I mean, just like you talked about the communication, Eric has made multiple transitions and that communication has been a useful skill in all of those changes and directions at home and his careers. So yeah, absolutely powerful episode. Let's go off to episode 11 with Ben Green. Optimize all aspects of your fatherhood. What did you take away from that one? In the past couple of decades, we've had a major transformation in the way that we work and the expectations on men and work and providing and that. And not all men have transitioned out of that. And not all men and not all even heirs of the world have transitioned away from manufacturing, away from physical labor, away from an older model into the new model. I'm not saying that manufacturing and physical labor and all that kind of stuff is not valuable. What I'm saying is that we need less of it because we have other advances. So we need more other things. And Ben is about this fin- the work optimization, location optimization, relationship optimization. And he's got this whole brand around the whole thing. And really when we're talking about setting boundaries and optimizing and making choices that are higher level macro choices of optimization, what's the impact that it has down the line? And so that was the first thing. And and this is the other we're never going to get away from this. At least I, there's, cause we don't evolve backwards. So we were talking earlier about Dr. Anna Manchin, the father goes out and hunt, hunts and provides the expectation as a father is that you provide. That's just the expectation. That's one of the expectations that's on you. Another one is protect. So in with Ben green, the conversation really is there's, there's really two ways to do that. You've got a, well, there's three. You're either independently wealthy, and if you happen to be and you've inherited that, great, you're providing. Wonderful. Good for you. Um, You might be an employee. Great. Wonderful. Go get after it. You can optimize those aspects. You can get get a better job. You can climb the ladder. Do what you need to do. Uh, The whole idea not is isn't so much like that you want to climb the ladder. It's that you want to make more. You want to make more because once you hit your prime years, income slows down unless you go into business for yourself, which is number three optimizing for entrepreneurship, your own business, that kind of stuff, consulting. And so uh, my family, we come from one. So my stepfather had his own business. My mom was a very successful, successful employee. And both have now graduated into the consultant self-work sort of world. So they've basically doubled their income doing the same thing, but just by not being interior to the, to the company. So there's lots of ways to optimize these discussions. And I'll tell you what, if you just YouTube or just search, I mean, I don't know if you listen to this and YouTube's not a thing, I don't know what's happened, but there's a couple couple of search engines where you can find out how to increase your income. Financial Samurai is a great thing. It's a great way. It's a great newsletter to learn about. He's a great brand. Um, Tons of things on YouTube, tons of different influencers just talk about getting raises, starting your business, doing that kind of stuff. You just got to optimize it, dad. Sorry, it's just a thing. The Another lesson that we learned about was setting expectations with your spouse. I think this is really, because there's setting expectations with your spouse and there's allowing her expectations to be set as well. So there's a, a mutual enrollment. And he shared something. He said, you know, the expectation here was that both parties work in the house. So everybody contributes financially to the home. And I was like, oh, I mean, whatever your choice is, I, I'm not a judge of it. I have plenty of friends with the, with stay at home moms, uh, plenty of friends that are stay at home dads. It's the whole, it's, you know, just whatever works for you, whatever floats your boat, but having that discussion and making sure that you're entering the marriage with that set in stone, like with that understanding of that discussion, that's really valuable. And finally, as you're increasing your income and as you're, you're moving up the socioeconomic ladder, there's a lot of characters, a lot of popular wisdom that says something like, you can always know the character of a person by how they treat somebody that has little value to them. 
So this is that idea that you take somebody out to the restaurant and you just kind of watch how they treat, how do they interact with the wait staff, right? Ben talks a lot about, hey, when you've, he's, he's reached a certain level of business and income where he brings in people to the home to help with household chores. And so what he's teaching his daughters is like, you need to value the value they're bringing to you. It's not just an expense. This is a person, they are creating space for you. And he had a lot of, uh, basically a lot of gratitude around that role and making sure his daughters grew up with that as well. That's a super insightful, um, just perspective and thing to watch out for. All right. Next, we've got episode 12 with Bob Kiamet, creating safe spaces for more. When you think back on that, what comes to mind? So Bob was out there doing his thing and he met his wife like years before just kind of and I think they, they dated briefly and there was this power of, um, I called this serendipity that he was out there. He met her, nothing really happened. I think it was like five years later or something like that. They came back and met again. Um, just again, through some sort of happenstance moment and found love and then got, um, ended up getting married out of it. I thought that was a really interesting lesson less so for the father, like for the feel good father who's listening more so for those fathers with older kids that are trying to find romance in their life. We absolutely need to steer our kids away from using technology to meet people and build relationships. Tinder is not the way. And if you don't know that today, you need to do the research it is unhealthy, um, and it doesn't matter which version of it you're using. It's not healthy. It doesn't create the kind of relationships that you want for your kids. And I, I tell this like when I was doing confidence coaching with with young men, you know, in college and leaving college, I always said, you got to have a cheers place. You got to get out there. You don't have to go out and drink. Your high value women are not. You're not going to meet your high value woman in the club. You're going to meet your high value woman when you go out in your hobby, you have some sort of shared affinity, which means you just have a shared experience, something you both care about and you learn about each other in that way. So I did dancing, I did art, art galleries, um, did some role playing, had like, those are kind of the two big things for me was just going out there, living life, doing dance exchanges, which is basically just traveling to different cities to dance in, in their cities and then going to different art galleries. And those were the two big things where I built a lot of my social network and I still care about them today. And so, so the serendipity of finding love just means that you're out there living and you're going to meet people. That's what it is. So encourage not only yourself as a feel good father to go out there and have a hobby and do something out in the world, but then also, um, or, or even that, because I don't want to criticize other activities. If you're, if you're a game player, you I just just find a way to engage your family in the games. Don't play the most men that play games are going to play your AAA titles, which is your classic male titles. They're usually violent in some capacity, and they're usually single player. So what you you got to do is just find other kinds of games that you can share with your family. So that just just a little bit of effort and and, and doing it that way. So. And I brought that up because it's what's your hobby, what's your social network, go out there and do it. The final piece and this one, this one kind of blew my mind because it doesn't, it's not discussed a lot. And he said, uh, he talked about the power of three for men getting together. So, and it was the core idea of when you're getting together, make sure there's at least three men in the group because it just creates a, a more balanced dynamic in the interaction and it makes it just a little bit easier for every and all parties to get together and, and, and do their thing. Um, I, I would definitely go back and listen to that episode if friendship is something that you care about, if learning about having more male friends is something that you care about. I would definitely do this um, and listen to that episode with Bob. That sounds awesome. 
So when you think back on episode 13 uh, with Dr. Alex Tam, Create Unforgettable Experiences, what were the things that, uh, you know, you took away and, and took action on? Uh, this was so fun. So Dr. Alex Tam was, uh, you, you know, we started with this crazy story about him being in Alaska and these bears and like being like 10 foot from a bear, like with his family. And I was like, good Lord, this is crazy. His philosophy in life is generosity and his philosophy of not only the generosity of his family and making sure that his large extended family has great experiences. And he learned that at a, at a young age from, I think it was like his uncle, his uncle taught him that, but then also extending that into his work family and saying, I, as a business owner, want the people in my employee to thrive in their life and to have crazy experiences. And what's really interesting is that, uh, for one of the first times in my professional life, uh, you know, here at Brand Builders Group, as a strategist, I've got these two founders that are creating experiences for us. They are creating opportunity for us to thrive, and they are definitely investing in us and investing in life experiences and memories. I think, I think that it's, I think it's difficult to wrap our heads around this extended generosity in a very meaningful and I would say intimate way. How do I, as a person of abundance, extend that abundance to the people around me? And so that's really what I learned from, from Dr. Tam. That was, it was really an interesting perspective. This next one for me is a great compliment to episode 12, and that's going to be episode 14 with um, Adam Kasich's foundational traits of becoming a man and a father. The number one thing, if you're in the shit, is knowing that somebody's got your back. And so when I was making video games, we tend to have good relationships with each other because we're crunching, we're building, you know, we're accomplishing something that has a lot of adversity together. And so the relationships you build under duress, um, they tend to last a long time. And one of the things that helped, one of the bad sides of that is that when you're under duress or in a high stress environment is that, um, it's sometimes difficult to explain to somebody else what your life looks like. So it's, it's that phenomena where entrepreneurs tend to like hanging out with other entrepreneurs because they don't have to explain the business in the same way that, you know, when I was making video games, I didn't really enjoy talking about being a video game developer with people that weren't because I, I would become a local celebrity and I'd have to answer questions all night about what it was like. Or, or help their kid that wants to get into the industry or whatever. And, and believe me, I've heard those dozens, if not hundreds of times. Can you talk to my such and such to get in? Sure, let's do it. Um, and that's how the conversations would generally go. Uh, but for, you know, for Adam in particular, him sharing that there was this mentor, having somebody that like really meaningfully believes in you and is pouring into you and challenging you and making sure that you're improving. That was really this critical, um, critical moment for him. And I, I really enjoyed listening to him describe this, this world and describe this, this relationship that he had. This, the second layer to that was part of, I think what his mentor taught him and that now he teaches is just what is character? What is it? What is character? And um, uh, character is something that we define. There are general principles of character. I don't want to get into them here today because uh, it's better for you to go listen to Adam describe. But um, it's something that you develop. It's something that you have. It's something that you foster and improve on. And I think it's something that men should absolutely prioritize. So true. 
what like impacted your heart um just really left an impression on you from episode 15 with adam labar lessons on mind shifting and creating impact there are moments where we as parents recognize that there's a milestone and our kids may not recognize the milestone and so there was this moment where adam was telling the story about how something happened and his son was crying because he didn't want to be a better man than his dad and i thought what a what a wonderful recognition of the respect that Adam had built with his son, that his son honored him, respected him, loved him, and that um, this was this tough milestone and how Adam kind of walked him through that. I thought that that element of there are going to be other milestones in life. Like I think of there's always a moment in the kid's life when they realize that the parent doesn't know everything. That's, I think, a challenging moment, I think, for most parents to navigate. And I think just a little bit of, not rumination, but a little bit of forethought and recognition that that moment will happen and how do you want to navigate it? So that was the first step. I thought the other thing that was really powerful that I recognized uh, was that we talked a little bit about understanding other perspectives on the world. And when I really reflected on why we were having that conversation after the fact, I recognized that Adam was a person like me who was a global traveler. I've lived in four different countries, one in Asia, one in Europe, and then Canada, US. So technically one, so technically three, uh, even though they're quite different and divergent now. So I've lived in France where I spoke French and English, lived in Singapore, and then lived in Canada and US. And even within the U.S., I've lived in multiple states, Northeast, Southwest, so California, Southeast, Midwest, I grew up in Detroit, et cetera. And the, the pattern was that those that have a diversity of experience are much more empathetic, much more understanding, and much more curious about other people. And that particular trait, that curiosity, feel good fathers, if you've been listening, you understand curiosity is the opening, it's the opening trait, it's the opening thought pattern to cultivate, to have the best life for you and your kids and your spouse, et cetera. So curiosity is that entry point and it opens the door for empathy. And so if you haven't traveled, go travel. If you can't travel, drive around. If you, the other thing too, is that the world is at your fingertips. You can explore other places and other cultures by consuming media, watching YouTube videos, cultivating other perspectives. I have a friend who I met um, at Podcast Movement, uh, what Mike and I met at Podcast Movement this year. And he was at the forefront of thought leadership. So he works with a lot of philosophers, a lot of thought leaders. He has a lot of big names signed. And I remember just saying, I was having a lot of trouble that it's very easy for me to find more liberal and progressive newsletters and, and ideas. Uh, and it's a bit harder for me to find center right and right perspectives. Cause I want to have, I want to have more of an encompassing perspective on the world. And cause I happen to live in the South. And so I'm, I have a more conservative people around me and, I've mostly lived in more liberal, traditionally blue areas, and I want to understand and cultivate more of an understanding of the people around me. And that was really from that perspective. And um, so cultivate unique perspectives, go, go see the world, uh, go learn about other cultures, and it'll really have um, a much, a very dramatic impact on your empathy, your compassion, and your curiosity. Yeah. And it also gives us that opportunity to see that we're not always right. <laughs> we, we can see it from somebody else's eyes. And I think like in watching you, you're able to, when, like when we're at podcast movement, right, we're in other environments, you ask those questions that bring out that excitement, those things that people are passionate about because you've had that, uh, 
alternate perspective, right, from multiple facets. What's the big impressions that you um, took away from um, episode 16 with Allison Collins, Take Care of Your Health? Boy, oh boy. <laughs> so uh, it's no secret that as men, we don't like medical, the medical establishment. We don't like going to the doctor. And um, heart disease is on the rise. It's the number of killer. It's the number one killer in the world, um, especially in the West, uh, both men and women. Uh, and just being aware and acknowledging of it. So uh, my grandpa has had two heart attacks. My biological father died of a heart attack in his 50s. And so um, this is something that as a feel-good father, you need to be aware of. You have to understand about your health because if you don't, you're placing more burden on your family. I'll say that one more time because I think it's really critical because as men, we don't want to be a burden. If you don't know about health, and you don't know about your health and you don't prioritize it, you will place more of a burden on your family. It's just a fact. So you got to take care of it and you got to learn about it. And, and Allison outlines, I think we talked about your 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s in the episode of like, what are the key risk factors of each age group? On top of that, we we did actually spend a little bit of time on the, the effects of sleep and it's pretty well known that sleep deprivation has a, a very dramatic impact on you. Um, but I think that it's, it's challenging because as fathers, there, there is that time period where you need to be aware and awake to take care of your kid, especially when they're young. The only thing that I can say is that if you're lucky enough and if you can do it to trade off sleep cycles, that in that time period, it's like, it is really a time when you have the young kid. So for the new feel good father with a young kid, try and trade and get your rest when you can and allow your wife to get like, by allow, I mean, like take the kid from her, feed them, take care of them and let her sleep as well. So like allow that space for everybody to get their needs. Um, Cause it, it does, the sleep deprivation does have long-term impacts on you. Uh, and so uh, it was kind of a little bit more dour, but it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a serious topic. So lots to learn, lots to learn from, from Allison. So caffeine isn't a sleep cycle. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> uh, as we move into episode 17 with John Gallagher, merging leadership with fatherhood, what was it that came to top of mind for you that it's like, Hey, I want to implement this at home. We have to raise people that aren't sore losers and that are great winners. We have to be able to, uh, explain and teach and coach the difference between winning and losing. And we spent a lot of time talking about this, uh, John and I, it was great. Um, and then here's another another prompt, because I think this is another one of those conversations that's just just kind of go listen to it if this piques your interest, if this idea of merging leadership and fatherhood is really your cup of tea. Uh, John has the Uncommon Leader podcast, the Uncommon Leader newsletter, so that's kind of his brand and what he's all about. Um, what is the difference for you, Feel Good Father, between being a leader and a father? Let us know in the comments. Yeah, oftentimes it's uh, just right there on top of each other. <laughs> the roles are synonymous, aren't they? 100%. Uh, so let's move on to episode 18, Joe Blackburn, Master the Art of Giving. What did you, uh, like, what comes to mind when you think back on that episode? Joe really challenged me to reflect on what was actual charitable giving. And his perspective is that it's not really giving if it doesn't hurt a little bit. And I was reflecting on the parable from Luke in the Bible about the rich person that gives their coin and then the poor person that gives their coin and what Jesus says about it. And that it really is that is, is what you're doing is giving hard. And we talk about how Joe does coaching. And so 
here's the background on, on Joe. He was uh, a regional manager for a wealth investment firm. So one of the top of the top, constantly working and coached his kids sports and did these things and helped at the church and doing all this kind of stuff. And so for a person where income isn't maybe the income isn't as much of a hurt or a challenge to give, it might be time because time is more finite. And so as we move through and think about becoming a feel good father, where are the areas where you're doing something that does cause discomfort and does cause pain in the perspective of charitable giving? Because that will have a much larger impact on you and your family in a positive, net positive way than anything else that you do. Um, the next thing was just his real focus on teaching abundance over scarcity. Um, in his family. It's a really solid episode from a real go-getter and a, a really successful man. Yeah. Scarcity can just be that pervasive kind of silent, low-grade fever that we carry through and it does impact our whole family. So that's very important to reflect on and take account. So as we move into episodes 19 and 20, values was something that was came through again for you here. So values with a baby and adjusting to your new role. Hugh Edwards and I had a great two part series where we spoke before he had a couple months before he had his first son. And then uh, a couple months after. So we got the, what are you expecting? What do you think? And then kind of like how everything happened afterwards. And I thought what was really interesting about this was that he he did have a relationship before this current one where they didn't want to have kids together. And, and there's some details there, but in that world, it was really the conversation of expectation of, uh, and this kind of goes back to that conversation with Ben Green, right? Like if you have expectations, communicate them. Um, and you really want to have a relationship with somebody that you have open eyes with. And so if you're not both aligned, you shouldn't do it. And I, and I, we were talking about suits earlier and I love the example here of like, it's like Lewis lit and Mrs. Zaz. And I don't, it's, it's on Netflix. You can watch it. So if there's spoilers, whatever. <laughs> so, uh, he meets her the first time he wants to be with her. She doesn't want to have kids. So they break up and it, it's a multi-year thing where like, it's a multi-season thing where he's dealing with that. And then they get back together and she admits that, oh, you are the one I want to be with and I want to have kids with you. And so from a fictional example, we have the communicate expectations. And while it does hurt, he, they, he does respect the decision. She does respect the decision. They acknowledge that they're not right for each other and they move on. That only comes through communication. That only comes through communicating your expectations. So make sure that you do that. Um, and then... On the other side, so that I think that's everything there is to say about that side. But on the other side, uh, what I loved about Hugh, because it was so fresh, was that he just said, having a kid is not what I expected, and that's a good thing. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think, I think that when, you know, if you're a young, a young uh, new feel-good father or you're a feel-good father that's mentoring or supporting another father through it, uh, just, I just find joy in the discovery and find joy in, in, in their experience. Cause, um, it's fun. It's fun to watch that development and change. Finally, from a skill perspective, you know, Hugh talks a lot about finding your values and finding what really drives and motivates you. And there's on one side, there's the, what are you passionate about? What do you, what do you enjoy? I think on the other side, which not a lot of people talk about, which is like, well, what pisses you off? Because that's also something that points you in the direction of your values. Uh, so that was a good conversation with Hugh. It's a two-parter. Let me know what you think in the comments. So we've talked about a lot of timeless things. This one is very timely because AI is becoming a bigger and bigger part of our everyday lives. You met in episode 21 with Jay Borgana, chat GPT, chat 
excuse me, chat GPT, GPT-4, future and possibilities. What did you take away from that one, you know, being a fellow nerd and a dad? It's difficult to, it's difficult to have magic in your life. It's difficult to, um, outside of some fictional worlds, really experience something that's magical. And we are, as a person who grew up when the inter- internet was introduced, uh, so I'm an 81 kid. So I was around, I remember without the internet, and then I was young enough to be in the early days of like the AOL. I think I was like mainly AOL online and then Sierra online, dial up modems. Um, if you want an understanding of what that that life looks like, go watch the movie Hackers with Angelina Jolie. Um, it's a great, it's a great geeky little like super topical hyper niche uh, show. You have to forgive that it is a um, it is a movie in its time, so you just have to tolerate some of the things. Just like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, fantastic movie, kind of a '90s movie. And every once in a while, we we get to see something that really does fundamentally change the world in a magical way. And generative AI really is as important to society as the internet was. So you can create and and have your teach your children about this magical world and create storybooks and have it interact with them and have conversation with them um, and be creative. And it's going to be something that they're going to use. And so it's worth your while to learn how to use it as well. Um, the The example here is really looking at uh, the Incredibles 2 movie with Mr. Incredible. There's a, there's a moment where I think it's, I think it's, da- I always get it wrong. Jack Jack is the, is the baby. And then I think it's Dax is the fast runner. <laughs> and so Dax comes home and he's got the math homework or something like that. And Mr. Incredible learned it differently. And so they, uh, they had this fight and they, can't do it or sends in the bed or something like that. He stays up all night, learns a new method and then tries to teach it and then teaches it to his son. And then his son succeeds. It's kind of one of those moments where this is that time where just spend a, spend a little bit of time learning a little bit about it, get some prompts and teach it to your kids. Cause, cause they will use technology. It is the, it, it is the skill to use in the same way that programming was 10 to 15 years ago. So learning how to code was the unlock for high value work. Today, it's going to be AI um, because you can ask the AI to code for you. So, and I've done this in the past. So you still need to learn some basics of technology, but this is a really crazy time. Um, And we are so quickly moving, uh, you know, into this really symbiotic technology and human experience world where, I mean, if, if, you know, let, let's suppose that there's some global um, EMT and we lose all power. So computers stop working for the rest of existence. Uh, think of like, um, I forget. I was gonna say the wheel of time, but that's not the right one. It's not the right movie. That's a, it's a, it's a good book series, but it's not what I'm thinking of. Um, the time machine, the time machine, that's the one. So in the modern take of the time machine, uh, it's got, a, I think about it because it's got Orlando Jones is the talking computer thing. Um, uh, they lose all technology effectively. They just, they just lose all technology in, in the future and uh, a, amongst other things that happen, but uh, uh, that's not happening anytime soon. So uh, chat GPT is something worth learning and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's chat GPT. It doesn't matter if it's Anthropics Claude. It doesn't matter if it's whatever version it is that you want to do. Get to know a little bit about generative art. There's now generative sound and music. There's generative text. There's going to be generative movies. In the future, you won't watch The Wheel of Time. Oh, sorry, you won't watch say, Lord of the Rings. What you'll end up doing is you'll turn on your device and it'll generate and create a version of the, of the Lord of the Rings for you, for your experience. And so that shared experience idea... Uh, is, is kind of going away. I'm going too futurist. It's not not too valuable. Learn about the tech, 
teach it to your kids. There, there we go. Learn about the tech, teach it to your kids. I, it, it seems to me I have a lot to say on this, so we'll, we'll I'll have another episode about uh, technology. We'll we'll keep it easy <laughs> for for now, right? Yes. So with uh, episode twenty two, Jerry Dugan, uh, fathers as head of household. Jerry talks a lot about leadership and culture. What did you take away from this episode? Uh, he's also a mutual friend, a mutual friend of ours. And um, so with Jerry, I love his story of the pink wallet. So here's here's what it means is that you as a feel-good father should be proud of your kids. And you should know that there's nothing that they're doing that should make you not proud of them. So what ended up happening was that I remember in his story that his daughter made him a pink wallet and he carried around the pink wallet with him. It was like a pink duct tape wallet thing and he carried it around and then he got some, got some guff from some dude or like a group of dudes on it when he had to take it out. And I, and I really, what I really appreciate this is that it really deals with mature fatherhood and mature masculinity. So, cause having pink, having a gift from your daughter, something like that, it doesn't make you less of a man. It makes you a family man. And I think from that perspective, um, acknowledging the change in the world and and really, I, I think for me, it, is, it, it identifies the people that are just really immature in their identity. And so if you're around people and they make fun of you or something that you have with your, like I, I, I still have the, all the paintings of my daughter and stuff like that around and, and all the gifts. And it's like, I don't really like, I don't really care what anybody else thinks about them because they're my daughters and I'm really proud of her and I'm, I'm really happy to be able to enjoy her art and enjoy the journey as she's discovering more of who she is and developing these skills about video editing and drawing and painting and writing stories and stuff like that. And I really want to foster that level of expression for her because I think it's, it's really neat. It's really fun. I'm very proud of it. And you just got to, you know, stand up, stick to your guns and know what you value and know what's important. And that's what, that's, that's one of the things from Jerry. Uh, the other one was just, just a motto, having something. So the entwining house, it's if you make a mess, you clean it up. You just have responsibility and integrity. So um, we're going to rephrase that because that was really good to help her clean her room. But there's a positive side to that as well that we have to express. I, I self-acknowledge that. Uh, comment in comment in the, in the comment section to uh, let me know what's a better way to express that positively. Um, yes, and yes, I know the chat GPT can help you with that. So that's, that's what Jerry taught me. Well, we're going to go talking about a pink wallet to what's in the wallet. And that would be episode 23 with Aaron Thomas. Money conversations all couples uh, need to have. Aaron is an interesting fellow. What he's really about is a loving marriage. That's what his goal is. That's what he wants to create. The number one issue in all marriages is money, money disagreements, money management, whatever it happens to be. It's, it's, it can destroy marriages. It can destroy you. It can heal marriages. It can mend you, stuff like that. Uh, but money is a challenge for most people. Um, and the only way to deal with that, the only way to overcome that challenge is to be educated on it is to be transparent in it and its use and to communicate uh, about it. And so prenups, according to Hollywood, are a terrible thing. But prenups also prearrange money in the house. So for instance, here's, here's a story that he told, which I thought was really interesting. I, and I don't recall whether he told it on the um, on the podcast, because he and I do have a re relationship outside of it. And he talked about how there was one, a group of people that he knew, a couple, where one grossly overperformed financially the other. 
And I think it was like, you know, 250 to like 30 or something like that. Like just, just that that's how it was. And the younger or so the, the, um, not the younger, the lower earner. So the one that was earning 30 only got to have a $30,000 a year lifestyle. And the one that earned the 250 got to have a $250,000 a year lifestyle. And when it came time to the discussion, it's just not right in that world. And, um, and it created a lot of friction and a lot of anger and resentment on both parties. And so the prenup, basically part of the prenup in that situation would presuppose the organization of money. And so there's another, so, so there's that part, which it creates a, a much more equitable relationship by just basically saying, here's the contract and here are the rules. And if the rules aren't followed, then we enforce the rules and make the rules followed. So it's kind of like you set the agreement, you set the expectations, you now are surrendered to the expectations and the rules and the boundaries of the household. It's a great system. Um, it's something like when I was learning about prenups from him and postnups, it's something I would definitely consider doing. The other, there's another influencer that talks about them. And this is, um, oh no, I lost it. The book is called, I Will Teach You To Be Rich. Uh, it's a great book and he talks about prenups. Yeah, I know. I, I'm trying to think. It. It's like, is it is it Ramit? Is it Ramit something? Anyways, doesn't matter. Um, not that his name doesn't matter. Just that the fact that I don't recall doesn't matter. Because um, the the concept that he talks about is you want to have fair and equi- equi- equity, and if you do happen to have a business, you do want to have protections of that because the law doesn't honor like it's like. You need to have these things written down to protect the business if that's the case. Um, but you also need to have them written down to have the most equitable relationship possible. Um, I can see Mike's looking up the name here for, for the book. We're, we're going to get it in a second. So I'm just going to keep talking. So It is Ramat Sati. Ram, Ramat Sati. Okay, great. great. You're so, right. Good. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I will teach you to be rich. Great book. Um, but I think, I think here, what can we take away from this as feel good fathers? It's, have that, have the financial rules in place. Uh, he talks specifically about inside out to outside in financial management. And it's a good distinction to understand. So we talked a lot about financial education uh, in a couple of these guests. It's really important to the house. So that's what we learned about Aaron Thomas. So the next one, we're already into episode 24, man. Time is flying. That was with uh, Steve Pastor harnessing fatherhood as a superpower. Not only is Steve a great guy, not only is he fun-loving, uh, not only is he a great entrepreneur and father, but he also really understood and was able to articulate the, the difference between your traditionally masculine and your traditionally feminine energies in both parties and how... Specifically for fathers, we need to balance the new skill development, the pushing the limits, the, uh, you know, the encouraging the achievement, the encouraging to getting outside of your comfort zone with nurturing and emotion and social skills development. And I thought this was really interesting because it's like, it, what, it, what it's saying is that the traditional roles are faulty because, and we all, I I know this to be true. It's crazy that I have to explain this. It's that you can't just be all masculine or all feminine because you're not all masculine or all feminine. It's crazy. It's this really awkward thing that has to be said out loud, which is weird. Um, But just the core idea that as, as a, as a father, you do need to push, you do need to encourage new skill development. You do need to encourage pushing the limits and then you also need to have an understanding of emotion and communication and social skills and nurturing. So yeah, so like we just need to do that and figure these things out. Um, we discussed a little bit about support versus steering. And so this one is directly related. This particular topic is directly related to the feel good fatherhood of a principle of ego. And so it's not so much that 
you have an interest and that your son or daughter has their interest, it really is number one, as the father, are you willing to put your ego aside enough to learn about your kids' interests? And then number two, are you creative and curious enough to find the Venn diagram of both of them? So I'm a tech person. I like video games. Let's suppose we were in a world where my daughter liked sports and she didn't like video games. What I would do is I would figure out, okay, well, is there a video game of the sport that she likes that we could enjoy together? Typically, this is inverted. Typically, the father likes the sports and the son or the daughter likes video games. And so then, as the feel-good father, it's can you put your ego aside to enjoy to enjoy their hobby with them? You'll create a deeper level of connection and you'll create more memories with them if you're willing to help them learn and enjoy their hobbies with them. And so, uh, and finally, here's finally, finally thing, finally, 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 which is, I like this one. Life is not meant to be all positive and life is not meant to be all negative. There's a balance. I learned this from, um, well, he was an, a, an Olympic coach and I learned it from him a couple of years ago. And he said, here's the reality of anything that you're doing about one third of all of your experiences should be okay. They should be average. One third are going to be great. They're going to be fantastic. You're going to love them. It's going to, and everything you're doing is going to feel good. And about one third is going to suck. And so, or you're not motivated or you're not enjoying it and that's okay. And so he was talking about specifically in the context of Olympic training and they had to just teach these athletes like, Hey, a third of the time is going to be okay. A third of the time it's going to be really, really great. And a third of the time it's going to suck. And I think just as a philosophy, just understanding that, just accepting the moment for what it is and moving through it, that's pretty meaningful. So the next one that we're moving on to is episode 26, with Brian Anderson, Force for Agents for Positive Change. What do you think of when you reflect back on that episode? So what I love about this episode was um, not only is Brian Anderson like super great. He ran the fathering together, multi hundred thousand, like multi six figure, not six figure, multi six, I guess, how would you express that? hundred thousand plus membership on Facebook, like a men's group, uh, been around for longer than a decade, like super great. Um, what we talked about here was about creating the life that you want. And it was in the context of the generational pattern. Now, when I got married, my father-in-law came to me and he said, now you get to, and he was talking to me, you get to pick the direction that you move forward with your family. And it was on that idea of mentorship, on the idea of calling into being, it was somebody that I respected and admiring calling me into being. As a feel good father, you are that force for your kids. You get to call your kids into being, you get to inspire them. You get to motivate them. And, um, that's really what a lot of, uh, the conversation was between Brandon, uh, Brian and I, and then finally, uh, Brian is an expert on putting together large communities. And so if you are a feel good father member, it is very likely that you are also a community builder. And so this episode and learning how to build effective communities, um, is worth a listen. Cool. Um, yeah, community is crucial for us. Episode 25 with Mike Gardner was about, uh, mobility matters. What, what do you think about going back to that one? So Mike has an interesting story because he had to fight for access to his kids. So, um, or his kid rather. And I can't think of, there's another, there's another interview later on of another father doing something similar, uh, Tanner. And I don't know if there's anything really more virtuous than that. 
I, I don't know if there's a, a, a better use of a man's time and energy than fighting to be a part of his kid's life. And the, I'm saying this because one third of all kids are in a single parent or less parent household. And when you think about the number of kids, it's staggering the number of kids that are that. So roughly, I think it's like 20 to 30%. This is all napkin math. So please forgive me world. Uh, 20 to 30% of the population of the U S are kids. So they're 18 or younger. So if one third of them and the population of the U S is roughly 300 million, then that means that we're looking at something like 60 to 90 million kids. I think just rough, rough nap, napkin math that, um, as the total number of kids. And then, so a third of them is easily, easily 20 million. So that means there's 20 million kids that don't have a relationship with their father. That's, that's a staggering societal number. And, um, it's, it's kind of dynamic and and, and where it is and how it works. And there's lots of discussion about what that number means, but, um, you know, Mike is one of the, one of them that was fighting for that access. And I think, you know, besides, besides unhealthy people, because that's not what we focus on at Feel Good Father. We're talking about healthy people that are living a good life, that are responsible, positive, uplifting, trying to contribute in a meaningful way and, and growth oriented. That's a feel good father that even if it's not all of them, it's some of them. And I think supporting and helping um, those men get involved with their kids' life, I think that's that's a really meaningful pursuit. So I don't know. I, I think for me, I just I just really honored Mike for sharing that part of his story. Um, I love his focus on mobility and longevity, right? So that's the second part, which is being able to use your body and being able to get up from the floor and you know, I'm, I'm telling you, having an infant now, <laughs> I've got a, I got like a one-year-old, I'm getting up, getting down off the floor and picking her up and bending over and doing all this kind of stuff. And you know, it's when, when she was born, I had a very different experience with myself than when my oldest was born. But when she was born, I had a very real encounter with my mortality and I had a very real encounter with how old I'm going to be as she ages and what's going to be my age as a demographic versus her age. And, um, it, it really made me address my priorities and clean, clean myself up and have a longevity focused mind and really just for the second tier, like with my oldest, there was a lot of shedding of ego. There was a lot of healing there's a lot of emotional stability that i developed and i think with my youngest there's a lot of am i even going to be around when she's an adult and uh and so that kind of led me on the next phase of my own personal journey which is prioritizing my health eating well um some of my colleagues now are just kind of like i i just i have an accountability group when i work out so i just text them and like I, I worked out. I pushed it really hard. My body's sore, you know, and there's kind of like, yeah, your body, you, there was like, what did, what did they say? Your 80 year old self will thank you. And I was like, hell yeah, he is. He, he's going to be so happy that I'm doing this and lift these weights. So, um, Mike, Mike was a big piece of that. And, um, yeah. Yeah. That's something that's important to consider is what are we looking for down the road? And also like you shared, realizing that, each child can come with a new reflection and something that we, you know, contemplate and work on. So great points. 
And this last one wraps up the six month mark um, of, of this first year, right? So we're at episode 27 with Chris Felton, approval addiction. What was, um, what was it that you worked through after this was done and, and Chris had imparted his lessons with you? Oh man, this is, uh, this is such a, um, Chris is such a great guy and it was so interesting to hear that it was this dramatic underdevelopment of everything that we've been talking today, communication, honesty, transparency, a hard skill, dramatic underdevelopment of this one skill that where he had a complete implosion in his life that was just like mind boggling to think about. And then it was this dramatic improvement in communication and vulnerability and asking for help and, and expertise that created an explosion and he healed all of it. And it's just like, it's so, we love the underdog story. We love hearing about people that have suffered and then triumphed over that suffering and created something new because it gives us hope that we can improve and we can make it better. And I can't think of a better one word example of what that episode with Chris Felting is like than just simply hope. It's just hope that it can be better and hope that you can fix the things in your life that need fixing and hope that you can keep and grow the things that are going super great. So we've gone through a full six months of episodes. This is a wide amount of knowledge, topics, things to consider, work through in our own life. As you look back and somebody's jumping in at this point and going, okay, now what? What would be the first step that you would encourage somebody to take on going, okay, great. There's 27 episodes and we're going to reflect on 27 more. Where do I even start, Jay? Mm. That's a really good question. I was not prepared for that question. <laughs> so uh, I, think, I think what I would advise any feel-good fatherhood to adopt, because it's so easy to just impart advice and say, go do this thing. And that's not, I, I, I think it's a default that defies positive experiences for everybody. So here, here's what I would, here's what I would say first. And as the philosophy of a feel good father, and this is what I would say is that, um, everything that's happened to your life and everything that you're doing has led you to be where you are today. So there's no reason to have any sort of negative perspective on what's happened in the past. And so even if it was negative, it happened and it's helped form you. It's been a part of the journey. Um, the nicks and scratches are the kintsugi, kintsugi sorry, of, of your life. Kintsugi is the Japanese art of taking bowls and mending them with gold and creating a unique piece. Um, we all are that. We all are works in progress. We all are kaizen, continual self-development. Um, you might be learning this for the first time, but I love Japanese culture. I'm learning how to speak Japanese um, uh, as we speak. So, and I've done a lot of Japanese martial arts in my life. Uh, we haven't talked about that at all. It doesn't matter. So first thing would be to take a look at your perspective because a lot of men come into this father thing, come into personal development thinking that there's something to fix. I'm getting, and I can feel that I'm getting fired up. There's nothing broken. There's nothing wrong with you. There might be a skill that you need to develop. There might be something that you want to improve, but at your heart, please internalize that there's nothing wrong with you and there's nothing that you have to fix and there's nothing that's broken. Sorry, there's nothing broken about you. Um, you may need to address things. You may need to develop. You may need to learn. There might be a skill that you have to develop. But the first start, the first piece is your perspective. Once you have your perspective, I think it would be... Um, I would suggest listening to the Feel Good Hot Fathered show, and please, please do listen to them, and listen to them in the same way as you would read a book. I would prefer if you just listen to them end to end. But if you're listening to a conversation and it's not your cup of tea, jump around, 
on the episode to maybe find a, a part that you would that you do like, or just fire up a different one. There's the great thing about what I endeavor to create. What is the purpose of Feel Good Fatherhood? Is that at its heart, I believe that all everything we talk about with success, about skill learning, growth, contribution, emotion, communication, all this kind of stuff, it's really about having a peaceful, satisfied, fulfilled life. And all the different things we talk about with regards to making more money or developing this skill or doing this stuff, figuring out where your identity is, it comes down to um, growth is the key to joy and happiness. When you're learning new things, when you're applying new lessons, when you're improving as an individual, what you're doing is you're increasing your capacity of experience. And so um, for me, the this whole Feel Good Fatherhood podcast, these conversations are me going through, uh, or rather not going through, but having these conversations with these guests uh, for the same thing that I want for you, the listener, is I'm doing everything I can to learn and grow. And um, through this effort and through my brand and through my relationships, I have access to people that are experts in what they do and they're generous enough to come and talk about something that we care about together. And so from my perspective, I'm learning in the same way that you are and I'm on the same path because I certainly don't know everything. Uh, My life is fundamentally different than it was 10 years ago. I was making games and, and I, I was in a very small world. I had, really interesting ideas about branding and marketing that are, you know, if I if you had told me 10 years ago that I would become an expert in branding and marketing, I would have laughed in your face. <laughs> so, cause I was doing other things. Um, it's about, and I, and I want to do what I can to cultivate these, these learnings. And I want to, um, and rather, and I, I just don't believe anymore in doing it by myself. I'd rather have people that I care about, And that's you, the listener. I care about your development. I care about you having a a peaceful, interesting, growth-filled life where um, you're actively building your everyday experience, your every year experience, and all of your relationships in a positive way to create what you want in the same way that I'm building my day-to-day relationships and everyday activities and my business and my family and my relationship um, and knowing that I'm doing everything I can to make it as good as possible. And that's what feel good means. Feel good father. Yeah, dude, that's super helpful and gives us time to pause and see what our passion and our purpose is behind it, right? What drives us for it. Well, Feel Good Fathers, I want to thank you for joining us in part one as we've gone through the first six months. We covered a wide array of topics here. And Jay, thank you for reflecting back on these, revisiting the highlights from these different episodes, um, you know, episode one through 27. And so Feel Good Fathers, we want to invite you back for part two, where we'll go through 28 to 54, but we'd love to have you leave comments on which episode or what topics are of most interest to you um, from the ones we've covered here. So if you've listened to an episode or you're looking forward to listening to an episode that Jay's covered here, let us know. This is how we can together grow and become those those stronger fathers that allow us to lead our families and you know be more present and impactful in our lives and our families' lives. So thank you for joining us and 
taking a look back at the first six months of feel good fatherhood. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you soon.